Hey, we're in jo uh, Joshua chapter 6 today, Joshua 6, part 2 of our series called Journey of Faith, Joshua chapter 6. <clears throat> You'll uh, have to bear with me, I'm battling allergy crud this week and so <clears throat> I'm not exactly at full strength, but we will muddle through. Hey, let me ask you, for those of you who live here in town, how many of you hear the train pass through multiple times a day? Yeah, quite a few of you. I know I hear it go by in my neighborhood all the time. It's interesting that living in a town with a railroad running through it, that can be something of a challenge. Christy and I lived in, <coughs> excuse me, in a suburb of Oklahoma City for 15 years. And it was one that had train tracks running through the middle of town. And so every day, I mean, usually around midday sometime, uh, if you were on Southeast 4th Street or Main Street, then you just got stuck. I mean, you just had to wait five, sometimes ten minutes. But anybody who's lived in a town near train tracks, you kind of know the hassle and the inconvenience of a passing train. I mean, you're already running late, you're driving up to the train crossing, the lights start to flash, the, uh, the uh, barrier arms come down. It's a frustrating feeling. But imagine if that happened to you as you were trying to qualify for the Boston Marathon. This actually happened in 2016. Um, <clears throat> more than 100 runners in Pennsylvania as a train crossed the marathon course and crossed it very slowly. In fact, one runner who was using this as his last opportunity to try to qualify for the marathon, he said that he missed his qualifying time by eight minutes. Now, race officials had communicated with the railroad line prior to race day and had received absolute assurances that the trains would be suspended during the race. Yet those assurances did not stop the train from crossing the course's seventh mile. And you know what? That's kind of typical. In this race that we call life, there are going to be occasions when there's going to be an obstacle in your path, a, a roadblock, a train crossing arm that comes down to, to block your path. But how do we deal with that? How do we hurdle those roadblocks? Well, that's what we're going to talk about this morning. Now, I want to recap a little bit because we've jumped from chapter 1 all the way to chapter 6. Let's go back and review some of last week. We established that the theme of the book of Joshua is to keep your courage because the Lord keeps His promises. And in our study of chapter 1 last week, um, we examined three keys to walking in faith. One of them is to receive God's challenge. Sometimes that challenge is an unknown. We recognize God's commitment. That commitment comes in the form of a, a permanent, personal, powerful presence in our lives. And we respect God's commands with obedience that's not only complete, but consistent. Now, let me fill in a few of the gaps between, uh, between chapters 1 and chapter 6. A lot of you are already familiar with the narrative here. Chapter 2 uh, is the account of the harlot Rahab, who, as you recall, harbored some of the Israelite spies. And she tells them in chapter 2, I know that the Lord has given you this land and that a great fear of you has fallen on us so that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. That's Joshua 2.9. And so in exchange for shelter, uh, Rahab and her family are spared from the assault on Jericho that was to happen a short time later. Chapters 3 and 4. The Israelites cross over the Jordan River into the Promised Land. Uh, chapter 3, verses 15 and 16 says that as soon as the priest who carried the ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge, the water from upstream stopped flowing. Verse 17 says that they crossed on dry ground. And so one simple step of faith, all it took was them to, to kind of dip their feet into the water's edge and God parted the waters. He repeated that Red Sea miracle from a generation before. Then in chapter 4, representatives from the 12 tribes are told to gather 12 stones from the Jordan, which they were to assemble to create a memorial of what God done in the Israelites' lives that day. Chapter 5 gets really interesting. The uh, Israelites are celebrating the Passover. Then 
Joshua has a divine encounter with a being that some Bible scholars believe was uh, an angelic being, uh, being, while others believe it was a Christophany. A Christophany is a, a pre-Messianic incarnation of Christ. And this being has a, a drawn sword in his hand. And so Joshua says, are you for us or for our enemies? And the response was, neither, but as the commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. There's an important lesson there. And instead of asking God to be on my side instead of their side, we need to be committing to be on God's side. But this actually all sets the stage for chapter 6, which tells the story of the battle of Jericho. The first hurdle that the Israelites would have to overcome in their quest to take the promised land. Now, Jericho's significance was actually in its location. The city is situated in the, the lower Jordan Valley. It's uh, west of the Jordan River, about 10 miles northwest of the Dead Sea, about 17 miles east of Jerusalem. But since it was strategically located as a border city, ancient Jericho controlled important migration routes from the north, south, east, and west. It was key for migration. Uh, through, through the promised land. Now, at this point in the narrative, the people of God, they've really got to decide, are they going to continue the, the journey to go where God has, has led them, to go where God wants them? Or are they going to back off and say, mm, I don't know, God. Would they move forward in spite of the obstacles, or would they retreat in fear the same kind of fear that their forefathers had known a generation before and refused to enter into the promised land. Well, we find in chapter 6 that God gives them a very unusual battle plan for overcoming Jericho. So we're going to read verses 1 through 7 together, and then verses 20 through 21. So follow along with me. <clears throat> Beginning in verse 1, now Jericho was strongly fortified because of the Israelites, no one leaving or entering. The Lord said to Joshua, Look, I have handed Jericho, its king, and its best soldiers over to you. March around the city with all the men of war, circling the city one time. Do this for six days. Have seven priests carry seven ram's horn trumpets in front of the ark. But on the seventh day, march around the city seven times while the priests blow the ram's horns. When there is a prolonged blast of the horn, and you hear it sound, have all the troops give a mighty shout, then the city wall will collapse, and the troops will advance, each man straight ahead. So Joshua son of Nun summoned the priests and said to them, Take up the Ark of the Covenant, and have seven priests carry seven ram's horns in front of the Ark of the Lord. He said to the troops, Move forward, march around the city, and have the armed men go ahead of the ark of the Lord. <clears throat> then if you would, uh, skip down to verses 20 and 21, where we see that the very next day, the people carried out the Lord's instructions. Verse 20, so the troops shouted, and the ram's horn sounded, and when they heard the blast of the ram's horn, the troops gave a great shout, and the wall collapsed. The troops advanced into the city, each man straight ahead, and they captured the city. <clears throat> they completely destroyed everything in the city with the sword, every man and woman, both young and old, and every ox, sheep, and donkey. And so Joshua and this very inexperienced Israelite army penetrated the massive walls of Jericho. They penetrate the massive walls, they defeat the enemies of God, they conquer the city that God had delivered to them. And they did it by listening to and obeying the Lord's instruction. And really the big idea, I think the, the one application that we need to take from this passage in Joshua chapter 6 is this. We are to listen carefully to God for deliverance in our own lives. So we find here at Jericho, the Israelites had faced a crossroads in their journey of faith. Well, guess what, y'all? We all face crossroads in our journeys of faith. But see, we need to remember, God doesn't place us on this planet without a purpose. He's got a plan. He has a divine design for each of us. 
I think that's maybe why Paul said in Ephesians 2.10 that we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God planned ahead of time for us to do. Now, as we've seen in our studies the last couple of Sundays, as we seek to follow His direction and fulfill His plans for us, difficulties are going to confront us, okay? Jericho's in our lives that must be conquered, roadblocks that must be hurdled. Now, fortunately for us, this passage in Joshua really teaches us something about how to hurdle those roadblocks, the roadblocks that would keep us from following the will of God in our own lives. In fact, three things, three specific things that we find from this text this morning to help us hurdle those roadblocks. Number one is communication with God. Communication with God. Look at verses 1 and 2 again. Now Jericho was strongly fortified because of the Israelites. Isn't that interesting? You know, we saw from Rahab's statement earlier, God has already begun to generate fear into the hearts of His enemies. And then it says in, in verse 1, it was fortified because of the Israelites. No one leaving or entering. The Lord said to Joshua, look, I have handed Jericho, its king, and its best soldiers over to you. So again, the major roadblock that, uh, that's facing Joshua and the Israelites on their journey of faith was Jericho. Now, if they couldn't conquer this city, then all hope for the Israelites taking the promised land was gone. Now, obviously, there were questions in their minds, you know, how, how are we going to get there? How are we going to scale this wall? Thankfully, Joshua had a God who communicated with him. Verse 2 very simply says, The Lord said to Joshua, now, when we read that, you know, a statement like that might seem a little bit odd to us. You know, God speaking directly to Joshua. It seems odd when we apply it to our own lives, you know, because that's not really the norm for God to speak to us today. <clears throat> but, you know, communication from God, that, that's pretty commonplace for Joshua. And so, he tells Joshua, I have handed Jericho, its king, and its best soldiers over to you. And then he begins to detail the plan for taking Jericho in verses 3 through 7. So Jericho was their first hurdle. But you see, whatever your obstacle is, God is willing to cross it with you. He is co he's committed to communicating with His people and to provide, providing us with, with strength and comfort and wisdom and, and His presence with, with hope. And if your back is against the wall and you don't know how to deal with it, let me give you this advice. Don't try to overcome it in your own wisdom and strength. <coughs> okay? <clears throat> yeah. Left to your own ingenuity, your own strength. You might go along okay for a while on your own, but ultimately you're going to stumble without Him. Okay? I can already tell I'm going to run out of water. So, Christy, would you go get me another one of those? So, we'll get through this together. Um, I want you to understand something, though, when it comes to communication with God. God is speaking. All right? Thank you, my love. I used to get all kinds of grief when, uh, in small groups together when we were, and in our former church, we're <clears throat> leading small groups. I would refer to her as babe. And they would just laugh at me. They would ridicule me. Why are you calling members of your small group babe? Well, she does happen to be married to me. So, it's okay. Understand this. God is speaking. <laughs> I think the question is, how? How is God communicating with us? Well, it's not beyond the realm of possibility that God might actually speak to you in a miraculous way, as He did with Joshua in chapter 5. Uh, in fact, we, we still read stories today of how God speaks to people in dreams and visions. It might be possible that God would communicate to you through the wise counsel of another believer. Or in His sovereignty, He may orchestrate the circumstances of your life in which His will for you is communicated very clearly. But more often than not, the way God is going to communicate with you is through His Word. 
God is speaking to you. I think there's an important question we have to ask. Are we listening? Are we listening? Are we taking time to daily seek his heart, to spend time with him? I love what Ralph Spalding Cushman once wrote. He says, I met God in the morning when my day was at its best. And his presence came like sunrise, like a glory in my breast. And all day long the presence lingered. All day long he stayed with me. And we sailed in perfect calmness over a very troubled sea. Other ships were blown and battered. Other ships were sore distressed. But the winds that seemed to drive them brought to us a peace and rest. And then I thought of other mornings with a keen remorse of mind, when I too had leased the moorings with the presence left behind. And so I think I know the secret. Learn from many a troubled way. You must seek him in the morning if you want him. You must seek him in the morning if you want him through the day. Here's the point. Make your communication with God preemptive. Don't wait until you're in the heat of battle to utter some foxhole prayer, okay? Seek Him daily. Talk to Him. Then wait for Him to talk back, okay? So are you facing a roadblock? Then do what Joshua did. Commune with God. Let that be your first plan of action rather than your last resort. Okay, so the first step to hurdling your roadblock is communication with God. All right, here's the second one. We hurdle our roadblock through, number two, compliance with God. And we talked about this at length in last Sunday's sermon, so this shouldn't be anything new to us. Compliance with God. Look at verses 6 and 7. Joshua takes the instruction. He uh, passes it on to the people. So Joshua, son of Nun, summoned the priests and said to them, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and have seven priests <clears throat> carry seven ram's horns in front of the Ark of the Lord. He said to the troops, Move forward, march around the city, and have the armed men go ahead of the Ark of the Lord. Now, when it comes to our obedience, our uh, compliance. I think we can lump our obedience into two very broad categories. Okay? The first, we comply with understanding. What do I mean by that? Hey, if you already understand what God expects of you and why, well then, make it so. Now, there are some things that God makes very clear in His Word that are His will for us, things that are clearly spelled out. I mean, we're to love God and love others. We're supposed to worship Him only and to serve Him. We're supposed to give to the Lord and to share Jesus. I mean, even though we clearly understand that these, these types of things are, are things that God surely desires from us, the ironic thing is we still have a difficulty complying. But you see, not only are we to comply with God's instructions for our lives when we understand, here's the harder one, we must comply without understanding. Wait, you, you, you want me to march around what? Blow what? What difference does it make if I shout? You see, it certainly would have been easy for the Israelites to, to ignore such a weird set of instructions. Or simply to just walk away from it all and go back to where they'd come from. Of course, then they're going to have to deal with the consequences of not following God's prescribed plan. Now, speaking of prescriptions, there was a doctor named uh, C.R. Hebry. He once wrote, Next to the one who does not pay his bill, the doctor's most annoying patient is the one who refuses to follow orders. Recently it was estimated that up to 90% of all patients leave half-empty pill bottles, cheat on diets, continue to smoke, or never return for checkups despite careful prescriptions and cautious advice. Hey, you want to slowly kill yourself, then by all means ignore your doctor's instructions. Now Joshua, 
you know, he, he had the option of disregarding God's prescription for victory. But in the face of such a great obstacle, he complied with the plan of God. Though he may not have completely understood everything about the plan or its significance, he chose to follow God. Now, there's an important lesson to be had there. We must be careful to obey God even when we don't understand our circumstances. Now, they do say that hindsight's 2020, and oftentimes that's true. There are a lot of times when you can look back on your life and say, oh, God, I see what you did there. I fully understand it now. That happens sometimes. But we need to learn to obey even when we don't understand. Is there a roadblock in your journey of faith? Then overcome it through obedience. Your understanding is not required just your compliance. Because God knows what He's doing, y'all. Isaiah 55, God speaking through the prophet Isaiah said in verses 8 and 9, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, and your ways are not my ways. This is the Lord's declaration. For as heaven is higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Do you think any of the Israelites actually understood God's battle plan? No. Now, they certainly saw the beauty of it after the fact, but they had to comply in faith first. Just like the priests who were carrying the ark, they had to dip their toes into the Jordan River, take a step of faith before God would actually part the waters. So Joshua moved the people to, to action. And God could use a man like Joshua because he was a man of faith, a man of obedience. And so Joshua simply followed God's instructions, and the people simply followed Joshua. And we already know the plan. God instructed the Israelites to carry the trumpets with the ark of the Lord following them for six days. They were not to speak. On the seventh day they were to follow this routine, but they do it seven times. But then they're to shout in glory to God. Because the city had been delivered to him. That's in verse 16. So, by shouting in glory to God, in essence, they were thanking God in advance for a victory that hadn't even happened yet. A victory that they were trusting him for. What an act of faith. It was for Joshua and the people to march around the city for seven days to blow the horns, to shout. Weird, weird battle plan. No previous battle, and certainly not one since, has ever been won in such a strange manner. manner. Now, maybe a close second was Judges chapter 7, Gideon and his 300 men that overcame 135,000 Midianites through a weird set of instructions. <clears throat> strange. Yet around the city they marched. It was an act of faith, an act of obedience. Now, what was the fruit of their obedience? Well, God's blessing, His presence, His provision, His guidance. I mean, things that He always lavished on His people when they chose obedience. And their obedience to God produced all sorts of wonders. I mean, as you read this account, you don't read of any negative spirit, uh, any discouragement, any disbelief. And as they marched circle after circle around that city that day, I'm sure that it would have been, it would have been easy enough to see the, the seeming impossibility of the situation. But church, we need to remember what Jesus said in Matthew 19, 26. With man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. And so they walked. And I think the life application for us is pretty obvious. Do you want to see God move in your life in an awesome way? Compliance is a key that unlocks the moving of God's mighty hand in our lives to help us with our roadblocks. Faithful obedience. Even when we don't understand what God is doing I think that's why Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 5, 7 that we walk by faith, not by sight. God's got a plan for you. Follow it. 
trust it. So hurdling our roadblocks means that we do it through communication with God, compliance with God. Here's a third step. We hurdle our roadblocks through confidence in God. Look at verse 20. They did exactly what they were instructed. So the troops shouted and the ram's horn sounded. When they heard the blast of the ram's horn, the troops gave a great shout and the wall collapsed. The troops advanced into the city, each man straight ahead, and they captured the city. Why? Because they had confidence in God. All right, two aspects of this uh, confidence in God. First of all, confidence at the right time. I don't think there's a better time to put your faith to the test than when you're up against something. And I think it was uncommon common sense to believe that God could make the impossible possible. And yet in the end, the walls fell. You see, y'all, the walls really aren't the problem. The walls are never the problem. We're the problem. We've always been the problem. We will always be the problem. You see, God can do whatever He wants. He has the power to do as He chooses, but He desires that we act in obedient faith, that we believe. But if we will, hey, He's going to take care of the walls. If we just have faith. Right out of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 30, he says, By faith the walls of Jericho fell down after being marched around by the Israelites for seven days. The people believed. Okay, now that, that Greek word in that text for faith is, is pistis. The word pistis means, uh, it, it's often translated as trust or confidence or belief, faith. But in this particular context, it more specifically means the state of believing on the basis of the reliability of the one trusted. Now understand, you know, the Israelites had already seen God's supernatural works firsthand. I mean, He just recently parted the, uh, the Jordan River for them to cross over on dry ground. And of course, their forefathers had seen many miraculous things in the wilderness. And so they knew that God was reliable. So they believed God. Okay, not, not just up here, okay? Not some sort of intellectual ascent. I mean, something that migrated from the head to the heart. Something that was played out in their lives. Think uh, trust with legs on it. That's what they believed. That's what they felt. Folks, wonderful things happen when we trust God, when we choose to believe Him with our whole hearts. I came across this uh, statement from a, a pastor who was talking about when he first came to faith in Christ. He wrote about his belief in God. He said, here is something I began to feel after I had faith. The unexpected joy of living things. At some point, living things began to seem precious to me. For me, the great fruit of belief is joy. There is a God. There is a purpose. There is a meaning to things. There are realities we cannot guess at. <coughs> there is a big peace. And you are a part of it, he wrote. So, we need to have confidence at the right time. And I mean, let's be brutally honest, <laughs> the right time should really be all the time. But then we should also have confidence in the right thing. See, belief is most powerful when it's placed in the right thing. True biblical faith isn't faith unless we place it in the right object. Joshua and the Israelites had demonstrated great confidence, deep faith in the power of God. And because of that, He granted them victory in their first step to take the promised land because they placed their faith in the right object, in Almighty God. We read that story and we have to ask ourselves, 
do we have that same kind of confidence in God? We want to overcome life's hurdles. I mean, we've seen, seen we can do three things. It begins with daily communication with God. <clears throat> this, the late uh, Corey Tin Boom famously asked the question, is prayer your steering wheel or your spare tire? Now, I've often pondered how much less complicated life would be for God's people if we would break free of spare tire syndrome. Our unfortunate tendency is to treat him like a spiritual spare tire. When see, things seem to be going really well for us, you know, we often ignore God, even forget about him. We, we thoughtlessly store him away somewhere for safekeeping until the crisis comes. And only when our circumstances grow beyond our ability co to control them, do we pull God out of our proverbial trunk and begin to seek his help for our journey that's loaded with obstacles. Oh, but here's an idea. Let's communicate with God daily before the hurdles appear. Okay, then we hurdle that roadblock through compliance with God. Not out of reluctance, okay? Not out of a, 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 some sort of legalistic, go-through-the-motions obedience that's given begrudgingly, but out of a heart of love for God. You may recall what the, uh, what the prophet Samuel told King Saul in 1 Samuel chapter 15, when Saul disobeyed God's instructions, but then he tried to appease the Lord by giving him a burnt offering. Samuel tells him in 1 Samuel 15, 22, Does the Lord take pleasure in burnt offerings and sacrifice as much as in obeying the Lord? Look, to obey is better than sacrifice. And you know what, church? That obedience should bring us joy. Came across this uh, quote earlier this week from Beth Moore. She wrote that our obedience does not make God bigger or better than he already is. His essence is unchanged by our obedience or lack of it. Anything God commands of us is so that our joy may be full. The joy of seeing his glory revealed to us and in us. Two major reasons for obedience are that we may become targets of blessing, that he may have the pleasure of bestowing it. And then, of course, our confidence in God produces all sorts of possibilities, not the least of which is victory. That's what faith can do, church. The Apostle John wrote in 1 John chapter 5, verses 3 and 4, for this is what love for God is, to keep His commands. And His commands are not a burden, because everyone who has been born of God conquers the world. This is the victory that has conquered the world, our faith. So, three steps to hurdling life's roadblocks. Communication with God, compliance with God, confidence in God. It, it's simple. Communicate, obey, believe. This is basic, fundamental Christianity 101 type stuff. It should be second nature to us as Christ followers as we encounter life's roadblocks. But as I, you know, ponder the message in this week's study, I can't help but wonder how many people without Christ? I mean, how, how do they cope with life's speed bumps, with its obstacles, its roadblocks? I mean, I really, I'm not, I'm not entirely sure how people without Christ are able to, to navigate troubled times when life hits them with despair and loss and disappointment. Now, I, I do know that different people have different coping mechanisms to kind of help them numb their pain or, or help them forget. Now, oftentimes those methods of coping are, are self-destructive, which leads to even more despair, which really just kind of, you know, uh, creates a self-perpetuating cycle that they can't break out of. But I remember what Jesus said, John chapter 14, verse 16. He told his disciples that after he departed, 
that God the Father will give you another counselor to be with you forever. Now, some translations will actually read comforter. So those who know Christ, God the Son, have within them God the Holy Spirit. That's the comforter that Jesus spoke of. And that's a presence that remains with you forever. You are never alone. That's quite a comfort indeed. But what about people without that, without him? Blaise Pascal was a 17th century mathematician, philosopher, theologian. And he wrote that there is a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of each man which cannot be satisfied by any created thing, but only by God the Creator made known through Jesus Christ. See, church, we are all tempted to fill the longing in our hearts with things other than God. Now, you know, it, it could be through relationships. It could be material possessions. It could be your spouse, your children. It could be work. It could be a worthy cause or your favorite hobby. And you know what? Those things are okay. Those are not in and of themselves wrong. I mean, many of them are wonderful things. But we can't place them in a position of importance above God. Because... None of those things will permanently satisfy the longing in our souls. Some people are tempted to fill the God-shaped hole with more destructive things. They seek self-glory and accolades for themselves. For some it might be even more destructive, substance abuse, sexual immorality in their search for purpose in life. But nothing works. Nothing lasts. Nothing can permanently fill the void in a person's heart except a relationship with Jesus, God the Son. Mylon Lefevre was 17 years old when he penned these words, Without him, I can do nothing. Without him, I'd surely fail. Without him, I would be drifting like a ship without a sail. You know the words. Sing it with me. Jesus, oh Jesus, do you know him today? Do not turn him away. Oh Jesus, oh Jesus, without him how lost I would be. Do you know him? Do you know Jesus as your Savior? And if not, why not? Do you want to know him? If so, I want you to pray a prayer with me. Let's everyone bow our heads. If you've never come to that point of decision in your life, where you've chosen to, <clears throat> to trust Christ for forgiveness of sins and for salvation and for eternal life. I'm going to ask you to just pray a, a very simple prayer with me. You don't have to pray it out loud, just in the privacy of your own heart. And understand that the prayer doesn't save you. The prayer is just an outward ex expression of a decision that you're already making in your heart right now. But if you would like to receive Jesus... Just in the privacy of your own heart, pray something like this. Lord Jesus, I believe in you. I believe that you died for me, for my sin. And I believe that you rose again to prove that everything you said was true. And so, Jesus, I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I'm inviting you into my heart and into my life. And I ask you to save me forever. In Jesus' name, amen.